Good morning again, everyone. I speak to you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what we have before us today is a very, very challenging passage from 1 Timothy. In fact, I've, I've never spoken on this passage, and I think that it's safe to say that many preachers have stayed well clear of this one for some pretty obvious reasons. There's something about it uh, which is at the very, very least awkward to some and likely to more people uh, deeply offensive when we approach the text using what is a, a very a surface or a plain reading of the roles of men and women in church and in life. And even though this passage that we have uh, from 1 Timothy uh, is very short, we could and probably should spend a long time with it. Uh, for today's purposes, uh, we don't have all the time in the world, but um, we're going to do our best. Now, this is one of the most difficult passages of all the New Testament, and not just because of its subject matter, but because it's been so widely interpreted by a range of fully qualified biblical scholars, uh, less qualified armchair theologians, uh, both those inside and outside the church and of its historic beliefs. And the polls range from accepting the passage, uh, accepting it in a strict literal translation, sort of applying exactly what it says to life as it is today, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the extreme other poll is completely disregarding it, as it has no relevance whatsoever for today. Now, as far as I am concerned, uh, I come to you today as humbly as I can, and not with ready-made answers either, uh, but I come as we all are, as a seeker and learner uh, who has questions about this passage, just like a lot of people do. So just as we have a wide variety of different interpretations of this that continue today, uh, we do come to it with questions. Now, our sermon series is called A Jesus-Shaped Church, and these sermons seek to present the truth of God's word today, and we do it always asking, what do these words say about the church today? Now, now about the church, uh, the Reverend Fleming Rutledge who is an esteemed biblical theologian and author and preacher who also taught my preaching class at Wycliffe College, she teaches that the church is not a memorial society of people who hand down a religious story custom made amongst other religious stories that exist out there in the world. The church is much more than a memorial society. It is the body of the Lord and living Jesus Christ. This is what we believe. We're not here because of a, a good story. We're we'll here because we are something greater. We are part of Jesus himself, his body. This is what he promised. So all people, every person throughout time up until today who are baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are God's very own children. They're part of his body. Now, his, his people, each one of us matters, no matter what our gender is. And God knows and loves us beyond anything we can imagine. And to prove it, he raised Jesus from the dead and promised that one day we would also be like Jesus forever. Now, this is the explosive claim of the Bible, that God is not some distant spiritual force that creates things and then stays out of the way and gets off the scene. No, we see in the Bible that God is personal. He knows you and he wants to be known by you. And gender makes zero difference when it comes to that ardent eternal love. Grace and light and peace and personable love. This is the character of God and what he has for you. I once heard that God has no grandchildren, then that's true, that God has no distant relations, and, and, and every heart is immediately known and cared for with the desire to offer transformation and new life and a new hope. 
So the task of the church as his body here on earth is to trust that that's true. And to live out the truth of that in real time as citizens of God's kingdom, as his own children. And much of the text of the New Testament, the gospel narratives and the letters, they all seek to help us discover what this means and to follow that call. Now, I want to I wanna say a, a word about the work of interpretation of the Bible. Uh, and I'm going to turn to John Stott, who is one of Anglicanism's greatest modern biblical scholars. So when once uh, speaking to these issues, uh, John Stott used four presuppositions about the scriptures as a starting point for helping us to make sense of the passage that we're looking at. And I think they're very helpful. Now, number one, the presupp presupposition number one is that scripture is our authority. It's our final rule of faith. That's where the word canon comes from. Now, during my ordination service to the priesthood, I said the following words that I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. I made that promise. So that's number one. Number two, the church throughout the centuries has accepted the authority of the Bible in this way. Throughout the centuries, as the supreme and key, the central rule of faith, and that this authority encompasses the whole of scripture. It provides a unified consistency. And we can't isolate one passage without embracing the whole witness or the whole counsel of God, as the Apostle Paul described it. Now, number three, the authority of scripture is also culturally conditioned. That's presupposition number three. It's culturally conditioned that every part of it it is inspired by God and written by human hands, is inseparable, cannot be divided, from the cultures within which those hands wrote. So we have cultures of the ancient Near East of the, in the Old Testament. We've got in the New Testament, Palestinian Judaism and Greco-Roman cultures that inform the way in which the scriptures are written and speak to the local circumstances that they're being applied to at that time. So that's number three. Number one, the scriptures are authority. Number two, that this handed down throughout the centuries, the authority of that Bible, and that it, the authority encompasses the whole scripture. Number three, that it's culturally conditioned, every part of it. And number four, uh, John Stott described the last presupposition as cultural transposition. Okay, now this means that in many passages of scriptures, there are two levels of discourse that the church continually discerns. So the first is that there's a fundamental truth that God is revealing for all time and all people. And number two, that the cultural way that that fundamental truth, fundamental truth is being followed is local to that specific time. And some things that were taught as practicing that fundamental truth are not necessarily applicable today and probably should be changed. So the task of scripture is to discern or uh, of uh, interpretation of scripture is to discern this place of cultural transposition there's a fundamental truth that god is bringing forward for all time and all people and number two that to what extent we ask that question is the particular way that that fundamental truth is being lived out is applicable to us today or do we need to change it based on our own circumstance and let me give you an example of this jesus uh, told his followers uh, shortly before he died, to wash each other's feet. Uh, now, obviously today, we don't do that all the time, even though Jesus commanded it. We usually reserve foot washing for commemoration of that historic event of Maundy Thursday, if the church even does it at all. Now, the original teaching is completely immersed in first century culture, in what foot, uh, foot washing symbolized. Now, the universal principle that is here, that is for all time and all people, is that we're supposed to love one another sacrificially, no matter how humble or low the task. That's the fundamental principle. And today, we need to discern what it looks like, what that looks like for each of us. What does it mean to love one another in all the humility and the, and, and the task which may seem so menial 
Uh, how do we do that today? So we live that out. So we don't do exactly what Jesus said in that particular moment, but we have to apply, uh, apply that universal practice. Okay. So I'm aware that this is a very long introduction. I have not touched on the passage just yet, but it's crucial with a passage such as this that can be so explosive, that is so emotional uh, for us to set a framework for difficult topics so we don't run the risk of forgetting the overarching love and call of God in Jesus Christ and not forgetting the spiritual authority of the whole of the scripture. And then the humble, prayerful, ever dynamic task of biblical interpretation and application based on those two claims. Okay, so we're going to jump now to the most controversial section of the passage today, and that's verse 11 of Paul's uh, first letter to Timothy in chapter 2, uh, and it, it goes like this. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So if we read that as it is, obviously it's at minimum awkward and probably deeply offensive in today's time. And there's something similar in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth in chapter 14 about women being silent. But this cannot mean that women can't speak in church because back in chapter 11 of that very same letter, he gives instructions for women who pray publicly and perhaps even more importantly, who prophesy publicly, which is to bring an exhortation to offer God's wisdom to God's people in the name of God a very important public task of speaking in the church. So on the one hand, he's saying, be silent to women. But on the other hand, he's giving instructions on how women can conduct their public ministry. Hmm. In Romans chapter 16, this is the conclusion of Paul's greatest theological letter. We have a series of greetings and final instructions. And he mentions some, uh, some very key leaders of the church, uh, several of whom are women, and one of whom is named Junia. Uh, this is a woman who is recognized as an apostle, which means one who had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus and was sent to bring the message of the gospel to God's people, to welcome them in to the family of God. So this is, this is the most uh, sacred task that uh, people are given in the early church is to witness the resurrection and to be sent as an apostle. And we have here in Paul's letter in chapter 16, Romans saying a woman has been called to do that. And we don't now have all the time to explore the, the multiplicity of ways that Jesus utterly transformed the social patterns of the day when it came to gender relationships and how individuals lived out that call with particularly women. We heard the gospel passage a little bit earlier of Mary Magdalene uh, being the first one to see the risen Jesus after he died and that her call was to be the apostle to the apostles. He said, go and tell, go and tell the, go tell the others what uh, you have seen and that I'm coming. So we go back to our passage. What is happening? What is happening in your passage today where it says, Paul says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. When it seems that the variety of tasks and offices that existed in diverse ways in the early church, that women were closely involved. So again, we have to pour ourselves into the culture of the time, recognizing the authority of scripture and paying attention to what was going on contextually in that moment. Paul was writing to his young protege, Timothy, and many scholars agree that Timothy at that time was serving in the Greco-Roman town of Ephesus and its surrounding communities. Now the center of religious life at that time in Ephesus was not Christianity, but it was a, a cult of Artemis. Now this was something that the way that this cult functioned and how it, how it functioned, who functioned it, was quite interesting in its own time. This was a goddess, so a, a, a female goddess named Diana or Artemis in Greek. And in the ancient worlds 
uh, women were heavily marginalized. Um, actually, the, the philosopher Aristotle believed that women were def a deficient form of men. And this was sort of some of the common understanding that was going on at the time. But in Ephesus, the religious roles were somehow reversed in a way. It was a female-only cult with a female goddess and female priestesses, and women were the key religious leaders. But in this cult, uh, you had leadership which very much was involved in prostitution, in status distinction based on wealth and physical appearance, the way you displayed that wealth in your dress, and other practices that were antithetical to holy, the holiness of God and the purity of the church. So when the gospel was introduced and the leadership in the church was being sorted out, it would make sense. It would make sense at that time that the habits that already existed religiously of the surrounding environment would try to find their way, their foothold in the church. So to have the same sort of social patterns, the same beliefs, uh, the same ways that people would conduct themselves would, would make their way into the church. And Paul wanted to make sure that this didn't happen. And you can see in almost all his letters that he's very, very concerned about order in the church. The message of the gospel at that time was explosive and radically reorienting to virtually all the ways that people related to one another were completely flipped on their heads. So this extreme division that existed between women and men were, was transformed. Uh, this distinction between the ages, uh, between ethnicities, between wealth, those that are wealthy and those that are not, and status as slave or free, they were all exposed in the knowledge, again, of this baptismal call of Jesus Christ, where there's no partiality, where gender doesn't matter in the light of value to God. Now, Paul, in response to the Ephesian religious context, says to Timothy that the type of religious authority that women have over men at that time needs to stop. The Greek word translated as authority that he uses here is very different than any other term that is used in scripture. In fact, it's the only time that this particular word is used. Now, the, the term is difficult to translate, but has understood to mean uh, to arm or armor kind of like a unilaterally for battle without any care for submission, like this kind of leadership that's single-minded, that is not sensitive, that does not care, does not listen. It's a type of aggressive, single-minded authority. Uh, this is the kind of authority that existed religiously in the temple cult at that time. Now this, uh, it, so what Paul does instead is say that women should learn quietly and in full submission, and not exercise this type of authority. Now, throughout the scriptures, one of the most uh, dominant and sacred dispositions of the heart that we have, that frames how we are to come before God as anybody, whether we are leader or not, but one of the most dominant and sacred dispositions of the heart is to submit, to submit to God, and to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Like submission, putting the other first, caring about the other's desires, working for the best of that person, especially when it comes to God, submitting to God's will is absolutely central. Now, submission is not relegating our value or our dignity or relegating our purpose or even leadership uh, blindly, but it's to be utterly humble and loving as you approach the sacred work of God. So in the context of what is happening here in Ephesus, it seems quite possible and likely that Paul is reorienting a very dominant way in which leadership was understood, and particularly amongst women in the religious cult. Now, N.T. Wright, uh, another wonderful scholar, has described Paul's call to quiet learning that he has in this verse as not about forced silence of women. Uh, but being more about women being free to have the leisure and resources to study. To learn quietly means you have leisure to do the study, which, something, which is something women didn't have, uh, at least was extremely rare in the ancient world. The gospel changed all of that and says, yes, let us learn together. Let's learn quietly. Uh, 
Now, some people have uh, on today taken a surface reading of this, understandably, and believe that he is patriarchal and that he is misogynist. Uh, and what is far, far more true is that he comes out of a culture that was so often that way, with rare exceptions, and he speaks using terms that people will understand of that day. And he himself was also in a process, just like us, of transformation of our own assumptions and our own beliefs that are culturally absorbed. The explosive reality of the gospel was changing everything. We see that in the actual uh, translation of scripture as well, that even scriptures that are being translated today still can have a, uh, the way they choose their words can have an impact on how we understand the word itself. Let me give you an example of this. Our, our church is named St. Mary and St. Martha. We're named after these two beloved figures. One who, uh, we have a mental picture of one Mary who sits at the feet of Jesus, sort of lovingly absorbing everything he has to say. And then there's the Marthas amongst us that are busy, they wanna to get to work, they wanna do things, uh, and, and, and both are important. Now, what we, and what I have missed up until very recently is that there's something explosive that is happening in that particular passage in Luke's gospel. So when Mary is described as sitting at the feet of Jesus, because of some of our gender stereotypes today, we again can think of a woman who is sitting quietly in submission and taking in everything Jesus has to say. But if it, we were to say that about a man, uh, then it takes on a different connotation. I wonder how explosive this was for the first century hearers to hear that a woman was quote, sitting at the feet of Jesus, because this is what a disciple would do. This is what somebody in formation as a, as a, uh, a rabbinic student who is being shaped themselves for teaching and leadership would do, would sit at the feet of their rabbi. Now, in the Bible, in Acts chapter 22, I believe, we have Paul himself, who describes himself as being um, shaped by his teacher, who was Gamaliel, this wonderful Jewish rabbi of the time. And it shows that the Bible often describes that in chapter 22 as learning under the teaching of Gamaliel. But the literal translation is, is sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. But our translations don't show that. They'll say under because it makes more sense because we can think, okay, this man is being trained for, for ministry uh, and for what he had to do. But when it comes to Mary, we have certain cultural assumptions about what it means to sit at the feet. So even amongst ourselves today, we, we see this at work. Now, if we take again this passage at a surface reading, it could seem again awkward or offensive based on where we're at. But Paul was working within the cultural milieu of his time, dealing with a local circumstance, dealing with a universal principles that are shaped contextually. As he was very concerned about order of this very fledgling church where gender relationships were all over the map and trying to institute ways in which we can function in peace and holiness and, and purity, the language that he used uh, was really important for that time. For us, what we are, we are to do, again, looking to Stott's way of understanding cultural transposition is what are the universal principles here and what gets applied today? We have a call to holiness. We have a call to quiet learning, sitting at the feet of Jesus a call to submission, a call to service. And the way that, again, applies itself today is, is as unique for us as it was for Paul's own time in Ephesus in a very different environment. So we have all these examples in scripture of Paul affirming women in public leadership, and in fact, giving instructions about women and men uh, giving public leadership. And here we have to be careful and pay attention to the whole counsel of God as we approach this passage. Is he saying that women can't speak in church? 
and ought not to have any authority? Uh, no. That's not that's not what he is saying at the deepest reading of this, because it's not where he sells, says elsewhere, and it's not what Jesus modeled after the resurrection. But what he has for us, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter what gender we are, is a call to follow him in holiness and in peace and a submission to him, to one another, and to grace. So there's much here still to wrestle with. As I mentioned, I come to you humbly. I come to you as a, a learner, one that is still sorting out what these difficult passages mean, along with many others throughout the centuries of the church. But I'm grateful that this is God's word and that his word endures and that it is good and that he loves everyone and has a calling for each of us. Let us pray. Jesus, we come before you just as we are, people in need of your eternal loving grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, your understanding. We thank you for the incredible dignity to which you have bestowed upon us in Jesus Christ, a, a dignity and a promise, a hope that was explosive in the early days of the church and changed everything, changed the way everyone related to one another. Lord, we down the centuries are recipients of this change, and we now hold dear and assume as eternal those principles which were first understood in the early church, principles of equality, principles of dignity and fairness and justice. Help us, O oh God, to take the essence of these words and transpose them to today. Help us to be mindful of those people whom are silenced and who are not included and to model for them that kind of humble love that you showed in the washing of feet. We praise you, Lord, for our namesake, for St. Mary, for St. Martha, and ask that we would grow more and more into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen.